Good afternoon, everybody, and um, welcome to, as, and, as Andrea said, our 71st um, Let's Talk. And today we've got uh, Pierre Val, um, a very, very exciting winemaker from South Africa. Uh, he is not called the Pope of Pinotage for nothing. Um, he's one of our um, members of the Cape Winemakers Guild, which is a very small group of uh, very talented winemakers that partake in an auction every year. He was working at Rakes, where he really honed his skills at Pinotage, Syrah, and Shannon um, for, I don't know how many years, many years, Pierre. 20, 20, 20. Until 20, 20, until he moved to Survivor Wines last year. And Survivor is, the, of course, also a, a very exciting project. Um, and Pierre will tell you more about that. And over to you. Thanks, Winnie. Thanks, thanks to everybody. Thanks for setting this up. Um, yeah, where do I start? You know, being uh, moving away from rights that was focused and uh, just doing. We started out like uh, with ten varieties, and then eventually ended up with two varieties um, because we knew that you know if you want to be world leaders, you need to start focusing. And uh, I think a lot of people. I know diversity is is a strength of South Africa, but it can also be your nemesis because everybody wants to do everything and and you don't, you know, you don't uh, get to make the best of, of, of it. So we, you, what, what we're doing at Survivor, we're actually um, using the diversity, but we almost using a old world, um, the, the old world um, uh, methods by, by by nominating certain areas um, and then identifying certain areas with and, and where certain cultivars does really show uh, perform the best, and that's what we're doing at the moment. So we're using the diversity, but not making all the varieties in one area, but selecting the areas and then making one or two varieties in each of these areas. Uh, so and that's basically what I love about doing at Survivor at the moment. I get to make all those wines that I used to make but all just in, in the right areas and right regions. So yeah, hang tight and uh, let's go through the journey uh, with the Survivor wines. Uh, you can see then on your on the picture there, that's the Survivor cow with her 11th calf. So um, let's just uh, start this all off. So right there, you can see the South African wine map. Um, it's, uh, you know, there you can see all the encircled areas is where we where we make our get our grapes from we we get the grapes from six different areas uh for at the moment for a bit of darling uh that we get for some chardonnay for for blanc de blanc uh, and then in the swartland we we make some chenin blanc pinotas and syrah stellamos obviously cabernet and then elgin we make the sauvignon blanc and chardonnay and, and then uh, Yemel and Arda. I, last year, I got to make a bit of uh, Pinot Noir for the first time ever. I've been wanting to make Pinot Noir since I started being a winemaker uh, since 1996. But uh, because 95, I went to tour in, in Burgundy and uh, I tasted with all my fellow winemakers like Franz Smith and David Nivot and those guys. We had a really strong class and we were in Burgundy at Jean-Jacques Prieur and uh, I was just blown away by the barrel, the, the Pinot Noir I tasted out of the barrel. And I've always since then wanted to make Pinot Noir. But then I got to make the daughter first, you know, Pinotage, which, um, but now I've, after almost 30 years of being a winemaker, I got to get to make the the father, or I, I, I look at it as the mother because she's very elegant. And uh, so, um, and then obviously, yeah, there's a circle right in the middle here, which is, uh, very different to all the others that's close to the coastline. And this is the area called Trado. And last year I started, we started to take in some grapes from Trado. Uh, it's really a wonderful area that's been discovered a long time ago, but it just needs, it just lost a bit of its mojo and just needs a little bit more energy and um, something else going for it. So uh, we'll get there in a moment. Okay. So just just a summary of, of of all the areas that I just spoke about, um, all the cultivars that we do, uh, and it, as you can see there, you know it's certain varieties in certain areas. Uh, it's not like 
in the Swartland where we do everything, you know, from Sauvignon Blanc right through to Cab. Uh, so we've, we identified six different areas and um, then specializing in those areas. Uh, obviously being, you know, making wine from all over, you need to also make wine in different cellars. Um, so obviously pick your cellars close to where you get the grapes from. So the Swartland uh, grapes, most of that go to Darling cellars. Uh, the Cabernet goes to Stellenbosch Hills, uh, the Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc goes to Al Almenkerk, as well as my, my grapes from Tradeau. I also make it Almenkerk, um, because I'm looking for, I was looking for a small little winery with a great winemaker with loads of skill and, um, you know, somebody who can, where we can focus on doing quality wine and, uh, Almenkerk was a good solution of that. Sarensberg, it's a great friend of mine and, uh, he asked me last year. To please, I must please come and help him uh, make some pinotage um, because he doesn't know enough about pinotage, but too much about Shiraz. And then we, I went there and I actually made a couple of tanks. And uh, when I got there the next day, he was still doing it his own way. So he doesn't listen. He's a stubborn old guy. Um, so, so dear Walt, um, I'm going to make a little bit more pinotage this year. So maybe he listens this year. And then uh, Barton. Um, at Kobe Falloon, actually, I do make a bit of my Chenin Blanc reserve with Kobe. Um, and at Sarnsberg, I do my Pinotage reserve. So all the smaller sellers I do identify as well uh, and, and, and where I can make my top, top stuff. So so where the Darling sellers and the Stellamos Hills is more for my terroir style wines. Uh, where Almondkerk, Sarnsberg and Barton, I make um, more reserve style wines and uh, gastronomical wine. Okay, that's in Guni Cow. Basically, uh, our story was uh, back in 2009. There was a, a, a farm next to the farm where we purchased our grapes from. He, uh, that farmer farms with Guni cat, cattle. And then one Saturday, off, Saturday morning, he drove to, the, to an auction with 20 cows in the back of his truck. And when he got to the auction, he, only, he saw that there were only 19 cows left on the truck. And he couldn't understand what happened to the 20th. So it was like two weeks later, he went to have a barbecue with his neighbor. Uh, and he, he then um, told him about the story about only, you know, m losing one cow on the way. And uh, the owner of the, of the farm said, you know what? There's a cow that I found in my vineyard. She was walking around grazing and eating my cabernet, cabernet grapes. And I kept her, she's in the back there, just gonna have a look if it's not her. And uh, he went to have a look and it, it was her. And then that's where the name Survivor came from. But obviously she had to jump off the truck and uh, she survived the fall and she's still alive. She's 13 years old. And as I said, that's her 11th cow. So yeah. that's where the name comes from. Uh, in 2014, we started the brand Survivor. Um, Gerard van Abad uh, was looking for a, a name. He, he wanted to make a really world-class wine, uh, top-notch gastronomical wine and uh, he was looking for a name and as we all know names are it's quite difficult to 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 find a really great name and a great with a great story so for him that was a really awesome story and uh, it just fitted in into what we wanted to do in the portfolio and in the Guni is very much um, it's a South African breed or African breed um, so it's very much part of our heritage and uh, it's so adaptable it's adaptable that little breed and uh, it adapts itself just as well as we do uh you know in all these different areas so there's quite a relevance to the story as well and people just love the label they love the the story and these days you can't just sell wine on a label there needs to be a story as well okay that's just an uh, old guy with some gray hair which uh i've already got introduced by winnie um then our ranges uh so when we started out, we just had the bottom that uh, the terroir range, um, which uh, which I told you about earlier on the Sauvignon Blanc, the Chenin Blanc Chardonnay, and the Pinotage Shiraz and Cab, and then a little bit of bubbly that we make from Darling. We started with the reserve range in 2018 uh, with the Chenin Blanc and the Pinotage from Swartland, and then the newest to the range are the two wines at the top there, the Chardonnay and the Pendulum, which is a Cab Franc Merlot from Trudeau. 
So I, I basically joined, like when you said, I joined in 20, last year, actually, I'm, I've been with the company now for one year, started in January 2022. Um, Gerard, I was the first winemaker uh, who Gerard met back in 2003 at Provine. Uh, and we had a couple of wines together and, you know, and dinner and so forth. And every year going to Provine, I always, always had a glass of wine or two with him. And in 2015, he actually, we went to play golf together. Uh, actually, myself and my previous, uh, my previous boss and his son. But anyway, let's leave it there. So he, uh, at one hole, we were playing together and he said, you know what, I, I want you to come and make my wine for me. And I said, listen, uh, that would be, I'm flattered, but I'm still happy where I am and don't come and ruin the friendship. So basically I left it. We all left that at that. And then in 2021, um, after COVID and everything, a lot of things have happened and just the right time of my career that I, he came to ask me again and, uh, I said, okay, give me some time. And two weeks later, uh, he, well, I called him and he didn't answer my calls. He played a bit of a mind game, but anyway, long story short, I eventually then decided to, to join the company and start Survivor and, and focus on Survivor because Ben Snyman, the previous guy, um, he's still around, he's, but he's involved with much bigger things and uh, bigger plans and so forth. So he never had time to focus on, on Survivor. Um, I, at the moment, I go out, taste the grapes, you know, at bot, I'm involved with every aspect of, of winemaking and of uh, the viticulture as well. I'm, uh, obviously, there's a lot of areas, but I have worked very close by all the farmers and, and so forth. So uh, they needed somebody that who were dedicated with uh, to, to make the wine. Right, so uh, the Swartland, uh, oh, sorry, the bubbly. The first one uh, is the Darling uh, MC or Cap Sieg. So uh, Darling, since 2003, is not part of the Swartland, Swartland anymore. Um, that's because I think the winemakers uh, and, and the viticulturists, they all thought that uh, obviously the style are, are very different to what the Swartland make. And they thought it good to, to separate uh, Darling from Swartland. Um, right, so it's with, for our cup plastic, obviously you need cooler conditions and the sea breezes that you get from Atlantic is really great for, for the Chardonnay that we use for the, for the cup plastic. Um, and then we also, we, we make use of a dryland farmed, um, block of, of, of Chardonnay that we use for, for this cup plastic. It's a Blanc de Blanc. At the moment we on, we just the 2020 and, uh, yeah, it's still lovely, nice and fresh and, and racy acidity. Uh, we normally keep it on at least for, for, for 18 months before we degorge. Right, then uh, Elgin, uh, the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, Elgin, the first, uh, you know, we started out in 2014. Uh, they made everything from Swartland. Initially, Survivor was a Swartland brand. But, you know, uh, with some time, they decided, let's just change it all. Let's focus on these different areas. And, uh, and we make the cultivars in those areas that where it really excels. So, so Elgin, uh, was, the was one of the obvious choices for Sauvignon Blanc. Um, uh, we actually first introduced, or we first got introduced to Elgin's Chardonnay, and then we found some really good blocks of, of Sauvignon Blanc as well. This block is actually right on top between, uh, between Elgin and, and Beliersdorp, it's, it's, uh, it's really nice and high for 570 meters above sea level. Uh, there's two blocks, actually the one east, uh, west facing, uh, one planted east, west direction and one in north, south direction. So, uh, last year I picked it at different ripeness levels. Uh, a lot of time you, you can get quite high acid levels on, on Elgin Sauvignon Blanc. So you have to be careful of picking too early. Um, so that's why I decided to pick one block a little bit earlier, but um, to, to get the freshness and the other one, I let it hang another 10 or so days um, just to get that fullness and the fatness, um, which I love about. I, I'm not a big fan of two acidic Sauvignon Blancs. Um, I think in the past, the guys used to pick it too early. Uh, and if, if it's a Dermaville or a Constantia Sauvignon, I normally like it to age like four or five years before I actually think of opening the bottle. So mm -hmm. for me, an Elgin is very much in that, in that uh, same kind of um, uh, style. So I, 
I tend to just let it ripen a little bit more and get a bit more tropical flavors. So the wine shows a lot of grapefruit flavors, but with a lovely racy acidity as well. Uh, so there's loads of different soil types there in Elgin, um, but ours uh, grows on more like a gravel kind of a clay, bit of uh, a sandstone, broken sandstone as well. So you, one can actually um, farm it dryland, but uh, we do have ir irrigation if we need to. That's just to show you the breakdown um, of, of grapes planted in Elgin. Mostly Pinot Noir, um, but you know, I've been trying to get a hold of some Pinot Noir in Elgin. It is so difficult getting your hands on some on Pinot. Um, Shawn and Sauvignon are much, it's much easier, although the percentages are lower, but uh, uh, so Pinot Noir is just almost impossible to get your hands on. That's the view of our Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, that's not the ocean, although it's close by. That's just a huge dam. Um, so that's about 600 meters above sea level. Uh, looking down from the north-south uh, face uh, planted block. This is it. It's quite, you can see, quite vigorous. Uh, we do open up the canopy quite a bit. Um, I'll show you a picture of that now. This is just to show you it's next to Feinbos. You know, it's like in on top of the mountain next to these beautiful fine moss bushes uh yeah i would be i would love to be a, a sauvignon blanc vine growing in these conditions just amazing this was taken a week ago uh, no not even this was taken two days ago if you compare this to other areas where we are already harvesting um i have spoken to some guys in darling they harvesting already at 23 belling Sauvignon Blanc and this stuff you can see there it's like green 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 hard so like we harvest like end of towards the end of March like the 20th of March only so it's a really slow ripening um, and this is actually the east west um, a block that's planted in the east west direction so it does take really really very long we had a bit of hail uh, in early in December when we had all that rain but uh, this actually luckily it was very early stage so that the berries dried out and fell off so these bunches are looking really nice and uh, sound and without any oedium or no no other problems so that's the soil a bit of broken shell a bit of sandstone a bit of clay you can see the dripper line there um so really Nice, and you can see that it's actually quite uh, damp. It looks quite damp. We had a bit of a five mil rain two or three days prior to this. So, um, yeah, really great uh, soil for, for Sauvignon Blanc. Right, now we're back in the Swartland. Um, so the Swartland, the name comes from the Ranosterbos, uh, which is a rhino bush that turns black after rains. Uh, with my, what makes us different, or you know, Swartland most of the time is all dryland farmed. Um, but our, we've got one big uh, farm, or one big farm where we actually the farmer has uh, has some irrigation that he, that we can use supplementary irrigation. So if it's in a really dry year like 2016 or 2018, uh, we can actually irrigate. Um, so we do also every now and then, like every. 20 days he does put through a, a irrigation as well but the soils do tend to dry out quickly because there's loads of wind there as well um, but yeah some places the, the the soils are like very deep or the the roots rather are very very deep they can can go down to eight meters um, they've actually recorded some roots going down all the way to eight meters in the, in, in the Swartland with these really uh, deep hut and soils that we find find in the area uh, as you can see there, the rainfall is about 430 mil per year, uh, although last year we had really small rains. We had in, in, in winter, we only had, I think, just over 300 mil um, and then also a very dry spring. Um, so that actually led to this. This year, we think that we're going to get like 20 percent less production. But then we had the rain in, in December. So now it's we estimate about 10 percent less than than last year so um but this, the berries are nice and small 
there's it's not like there's less bunches there's just less uh, the berries are, are smaller so that obviously means uh, more concentration so the quality will be really great this year um, you will notice that i have mentioned there in the right hand corner the volumes that you do at the moment so um yeah we obviously still quite a young brand so we'll want to grow that with the next couple of in the next five or six years we want to double double the production um we do have enough vignettes so it's the same quality vignettes we've got more than enough of but um we rather grow with the market than making too much and not selling it which a lot of guys do it other, do it that way around and then you have a problem of too much wine in your cellar Great. So obviously it's great for Shannon. Shannon, as a variety, as we all know, it's a chameleon. Uh, it, it, it adapts itself in, in any uh, or most areas, not any. It likes a bit of sunshine. It likes a bit of heat to show itself, to really uh, excel and um, to show its, its, its true colors. Um, you know, that's also one thing I found out in, in, in Tilbach. You know, you, you, you break out the, up, open the canopy at pea size and uh, then you don't get sunburn. Um, but if you break it out too late, uh, then you get sunburn. And when I came, when I joined Survivor and all these, the farmers there in the Swartan, I told them, yeah, come on, boys, you have to break out a bit of leaves. You have to get sunlight there into your bunches. I said, no, sorry, we're going to get sunburn. I said, sorry, that's, uh, next year we're going to do it because I started there in January. That was already too late. Um, so we did it this year and the guy told me yesterday, I can't believe that there's no sunburn uh, and it's exposed to sunlight. I said, yeah, you must just listen to me. And you guys just, even the viticulture said, uh, no, I'm crazy. I said, guys, I mean, I've got some experience on it's a areas that's a bit warmer than you guys. So just, let's just try it out. Just try it out. So we've done a couple of um, trials this year and true as Bob, there's no sunburn, obviously a, a bit yellower. He said, yeah, there's no sunburn, but it's the berries are yellow. I said, that's what I want. That's what I want. It's going to go into, into barrels. So really loads of concentration and fruit and, and, and more complexity that you get and layered. Um, okay. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I'm getting trigger happy. Um, so obviously, you know, in the Swartland, uh, normally it's a bit drier, so you don't have to spray so much. Um, and, uh, we don't farm organically, but, uh, we do. We do look at weather conditions before we spray. Um, and the, the, the wine's grown on, on our soil that we make for the for this Shannon. Uh, it's 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 uh, all unhutton type of soil, so that gives you a lot of fleshy, uh, very much a fleshy mid palate, um, like dry apricot, a bit of uh, white peach, and dry apricot only comes with age, but uh, white more a white peach um, nectarine kind of flavor, which is amazing and very accessible and very creamy on a mid palate. So with this wine, we'll, we'll ferment 50% in tank and 50% in barrel. Um, but the barrels are all these bigger, huge barrel, 500 liter barrels. So uh, I did use some new oak last year, but the new oak didn't come through. The wine didn't handle the new oak. It was much better in older barrels. So, um, yeah, Angela will probably clap her hands because she still remember. And when he, um, I used to love new oak. Um, in the early days at Drake's, but I, you know, we're all getting more clever and more mature as we get on. Um, all right. So, um, uh, as you can see, uh, um, one of the mottos in the Swartland is small berries, big taste. So that's, uh, very true, especially this year. Cool. So, um, and the Swartland, uh, you can see there, the breakdown, what they do there. Um, mostly Shannon. I mean, the other is obviously stuff like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, and all the stuff that needs to be planted in 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 in, in Stellenbosch or Constantia. So uh, the bigger berry or the bigger berry varieties like Chenin Blanc, Shira, and Pinotage, and the rare white blend. I mean, obviously that's like uh, stuff like uh, all the Rhone Rhone whites. Um, yeah, they tend to do better the big berry varietals in the Swartland, like Arnash and so forth. <clears throat> so, uh, this is just, uh, pictures of, of the Shannon vineyard that where we get grapes from. You can, 
see the nice and uh, this is about 15 year old vineyard so it looks older because it's got a very 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 thick trunk but uh, and you can see the lines there the dripper lines um it's very it's not common to see that in a swartland this was taken mid-december after that first rain we had and uh, you can see still how green how green it is um i'm just looking at my my future crop there with very very beautifully formed grapes there uh, this was the same day and then this was taken yesterday uh went to assess the yeah, last week i was in, in belgium and holland um doing some marketing and um i was wanting to go there last week but uh couldn't so yesterday was my vineyard day and you can see in one month the beautiful um you see there's hardly any sun so you can see a little bit of brown but that's not sunburn i mean sunburn you'll see when it's like raisiny and or completely dark so that's exposed bunch in the middle of the swartland uh, in the middle of january so um really you should have tasted that it's so you can just when you look at it, it you just want to eat it and um it's got so much flavor uh but if you turn it around obviously it's more green uh, it's green, completely green at the back, although it's already, it's soft and obviously the sugar, but the sugar is obviously higher uh, with the yellow, the yellow berries. <clears throat> That's what you get that fruit salad, the, the, the complexity, you get the acidity from the greener berries and the fruit from the, the yellow berries. And that's what you want. In the past, the guys were just too close, the canopy was too close, then you can get easily a one dimensional wine with Shannon. So you need to expose it to really show its true character. And the Swartland is, for me, the area for Shannon. This is uh, just a, a picture of, uh, of the soil, a bit of that Hutton-like soil that we have on this specific block. Um, yeah, it also looks quite spongy. Um, because, yeah, it does, when it, when it rains, it absorbs the water and it like a sponge. So it's, um, it's a really great old water holding capacity. Okay, so we're back in Elgin now with the Chardonnay. Chardonnay, um, yeah, that's just the reason why we went there. So we uh, uh, we actually get a, the grapes from uh, Almenkerk from from uh, Eurus. Got like four different clones that we use, um, and we'll we'll then uh, vinify them. You know, all separate dates, obviously, but fifty percent is normally crushed, distemmed, and the other half is um, we do a whole bunch. You get much more structure from the crust, the stem, and lovely elegance from the uh, from the whole bunch. Um, this is much lower than a Sauvignon Blanc, about 300 meters above sea level, uh, where the Sauvignon was almost 600. Um, but it still has the cooling effect of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the soil is more shale, more Bockefeld scaly almost. It's a similar shale that we get from Trado. Um, it's also Bockefeld scaly. And then you get a Bockefell shale, and then you get a Bockefell shale also in, in Yemel and Arde Ridge, where I got my Pinot Noir from last year. And then a Bockefell shale on um, Almondkerk soil uh, on, on, on his um, farm as well. So that's a common thread through the wines is the shale. I mean, one thing I learned in Tilbach was the, uh, you know, how how important shale was, and um, especially on in blending. Um, it, it gives you so much minerality and so much freshness and aging potential. You normally get pHs of your whites are like 3.2, 3.25, the reds 3.4. Whereas sometimes in, in, in the Swartland, it can be 3.7, 3.6, you know, if it's uh, just because of the soil, different mm -hmm. soil types. But the moment you move on to shale, you already get <clears throat> much lower pHs and which makes for great aging. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so the wines that we get there is very flinty, very terroir driven, lovely racy acid. So the, in the past, they used to only, uh, you know, not do any mellow. Um, and I'm also not a big mellow lactic guy because we're, you know, because of my history and where I'm coming from. But, um, you know, when you, when you make wine from areas like Elgin, uh, and cooler areas, you definitely need to look at that just as a building building block. You don't need to do 100% mellow, but what what I do is um, I do about 20% mellow last year, and uh, just kept it separate and see how it turns out. And 
I've basically used everything in my blend. I'm actually bottling next week my 2022 Elgin Chardonnay, and it's uh, it's going to be a really a mouth-watering, beautiful wine, such balanced and complex. Um, with still with a PS of 3.1 and an asset of uh, 6.7, even after that 20% mellow. So I'm glad I did that um because you can just imagine that as asset levels it will take a year a year and a half before you can actually really enjoy the wine so and the style if you compare it i mean uh, you guys are obviously mostly today we're dealing with mostly foreign 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 people so if you compare it to a style it will probably be closer to polygony montrachet because um uh you know it's 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 quite it's quite flinty and we do use quite a lot of uh, oak on it it's 100 well, percent oak but it's all burgundy barrels all two to five 300 and 500 but um and about 50 percent second and third fill um but the oaking for me is it's we only use burgundy barrels so um very flinty the wine shows a bit of oak but not i mean it's not like in the past like in the early 2000s where you got these buttery wines this is completely that uh, not that um in Elgin, you can't make that style. Definitely not. You'll never get that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, the, this is probably our best selling wine at the moment in, in Holland and in Belgium. People are going crazy about this wine. Right, then uh, with the reds um, on the terroir range, the reds are the Pinotage, Shira, and, and Cabernet. That's Shira and Pinotage is from Swartland. Um, so this is from two sides is all trellis vineyards uh, on decomposed granite and on um, uh, so decomposed granite and, and hutton soil so with the red hutton soil the trellis vineyards is on hutton soil there you get that fleshy the mid palette quite a uh, quite a lot of viscosity and and from decomposed granite you get the freshness um, and um, dark dark fruit structure from the from the bush vines but the decomposed granite gives you a lot more freshness than what you get on Hutton soil. So those two combine really, really well together and make get you, you get a wine with great drinkability, but with enough, enough concentration to really enjoy. So, um, uh, like in the first couple of years in 2000, you probably would have, the styles were very jammy, very, uh, you know, just too bold. And there was probably more Parker style or driven wines, just too much oaking and so forth. So with this Pinotage, um, I just make use of uh, only 30% new oak and the rest second and third full or 300 liter barrels. But this style, we just do pump over. So very elegant, uh, soft, gentle way of extracting. Here I'm standing in the Pinotage vineyard. This is the block that we use. Um, one of the two blocks that I use for, for the terroir pinotage, the Swartland pinotage. You can see there, this is planted in a uh, east-west direction. And uh, yeah, this block is about uh, 15 years old. And the bush vine that we make use of is about 22 years old. That's uh, the soil. Just a picture from from the top uh you can see there a bit of uh coffee clip you see that uh, which is coffee stone um directly translated uh that's on top of the hutton soil so it's quite a dark soil it absorbs quite a bit of heat as well um but it's very spongy underneath and uh so it gives you that concentration and that mid palette um uh if you yeah on the soil the sira a sira is um, on a different piece of land. It, it's about it's about uh, ten kilometers from where we grow our pinotage, uh, but we also have some uh, irrig irrigation there. Some uh, uh, here we probably irrigate also every two weeks if needed. Um, and uh, the vines are much younger than the, than the pinotage and the shannon. So. Uh, it's uh, last year I could actually make a bit of I, I used a bit of whole bunch fermenting um, because it was a really late vintage in 2022. So about I did about 40 percent whole bunch ferment on one section, not everything. I do play around a lot. I mean, I'm one of 
I, I believe that the more components you have, the more complex wine you can make. And uh, so what's great about having all these grapes, you can do, you can make so many different experiments and vinify it all separately uh, and then later blend it all together. Um, so yeah, this, this wine it gives you a lot of spice, uh, the peppery spice and licorice, big dark fruit, uh, I mean um, dark color. So it's really, really intense color that you get. Um, but what I've also learned here is no, don't use new oak, um, only bigger barrels, 500 liter barrels. Um, so uh, to, to preserve those spices, those typical elegant spices, I compared this more to the St. Joseph in style. This is the young vineyard you can see there. It's like um, still nice and young very um not too vigorous so we do uh we do we do manage the crop quite nicely we, we we drop off you can see if you look closely you'll see there's some grapes lying on the ground there this was also taken mid-december so we do a bit of um uh, yield control and then also when it comes to to raisin we'll drop off drop all the green bunches uh to get nice and even even ripening so uh, yeah, actually a block next to it, Bukhanov's Kloof takes, takes a bit of those grapes as well. That's uh, just a close up on the soil. <clears throat> and the cab, all right. So obviously for me, there's only one, one spot for cab, one place, and that's in Stellenbosch. Um, so here we've got a uh, two two blocks that we make use of uh, one from Helderberg and one from Botterfeer. Um So it's a nice combination of the two. This is probably old world, you know, a bit more old world, bit of new world combination. Where Helderberg gives you a bit more uh, of that old world characters. Uh, Botterfeer gives you more more flesh and a bit more new world. Um, so yeah, Stellenbosch you've all probably been there it's much more mediterranean um and and not big difference between day and night temperature like if you go inland say like towards Trado. uh so it's more uh, a granite shale kind of soil the right amount of clay just to you know because i've also seen that with cabernet if it's on soil that's too well drained um you can easily you get very small, even smaller berries. It's already a cultivar with small berries and you don't want it to go too small. Otherwise you get so much tannin and dried out tannin that you need to wait 20 years before you can really enjoy that. And um, yeah, some of us, yeah, we can't wait that long. So it's just, just too crazy. So yeah, um, the warmer soils that you get from, from obviously the darker, the warmer they get. Rainfall is a bit higher than in Swartland um so there's no problem with water and yeah we have luckily we want to we have virus free vignettes uh, where that's quite a thing creeping in these days is virus um so if you look in like end of end of march middle april if you stand afar and you look into Stellenbosch it will it will look very beautiful romantic lovely red leaves but uh it's uh it's not so great it's all a lot of virus so that's the biggest problem I can foresee with Cabernet at the moment in Stellenbosch um, and all over is, is the virus situation that we have in this country. Um, yeah, so that's one great positive about, you know, the Survivor uh, brand. We don't own any vignettes. We do contract vignettes. So we can, that we contract maybe for five years um, at a time. And if we see that uh, it's going backwards or the quality is dropping, or there's some virus creeping in, we can always move over to, to a next block. So that's also why I always, uh, I never take grapes from just one block. I do experiment with other blocks so that when it happens, I, I'm not in a dark. I already know uh, which blocks are actually worth using and um, that I can still get good quality of. So yeah, it's quite a smaller production, about 2000 cases. So this is probably i mean our biggest sales are in pinotage and shiraz so we'll probably keep the cab right there at the moment um so we'll probably grow a little bit but not not much more 
than 2,000 cases by six. So yeah, elevation is 136 meters above sea level, and mostly CS46 clone. It's very, it's probably the the most common one that we have in South Africa, in South Africa, um, and a little bit of CS169, or, um, but uh, we only have the one of the clone 46 uh, for survivor. Right, so obviously there's no um, surprise there, CAB being the mostly planted uh, grape, single variety in Stellenbosch. And then a bit of Pinotage and Shannon. One probably would have thought a bit more Sauvignon, but yeah, that's pretty much even um, at the moment. Uh, just to let you know, um, South Africa had about, in the early 2000s, we had just over 100,000 hectares planted um, total area under vineyard. It's now already at 90,000. So it's getting less and less and less taken over by citrus, citrus, a lot of citrus and also uh, blueberries and some fruit. I mean, just for example, I mean, in 20 years that I've been in Tolbach, we the, the co-op there harvested like uh, just over 10,000 tons, close to 15,000. And um, when I left there in 2021, they were just scratching, uh, scraping on 1,000 tons. So a uh, lot of vines taken out um, and uh, replanted with, with, with fruit. Um, but for fruit, you need water. And luckily, I mean, Tilbuck guys had water. So, but uh, yeah, it's, it's in one way, it's a good thing um, because it obviously eliminates uh, all, the, all the, the bad quality stuff have been taken out and the better stuff are being kept behind. Um, but then again, we also need a bit more old vineyards. Um, you know, our vines tend to, we tend to take it out after 20, 25 years. But there's quite a, a new thing going now with, with, with um, uh, old vineyards, vineyards of older than 30, 35 years old, which is, um, yeah, quite something special, especially on the Shannon side, they're doing quite a lot of work on that. Um, right, then the reserve range. We uh, have only two wines in the reserve range, um, the Shannon and the Pinotage, and both of them come from a farm uh, near Darling, uh, between Darling and um, Marmersbury uh, on decomposed um, granite. So. Yeah, and it's all bush vine. So both of them are made from bush vine uh, vineyards. So the Shannon are from made from twenty year old plus vines, decomposed granite, as I said. And yeah, the wines are just showing. We've actually we on the twenty twenty at the moment, um, and that wine shows loads of minerality, freshness, still, and um, it's one of my favorite wines at the moment. Um, uh, the oaking we use are, is like just about 40% new, all 400 liter barrels, and the rest second, third full. And I use quite a lot of uh, natural ferment. Um, and I'm probably going to do much more this year, much more natural ferment. So a small production of 500 cases. Uh, it's really a, a great example of Swartland Shannon. Um, in this case, it actually does take the new oak. But the oak that we use is, like I said, uh, bigger. It's like 400 liters and it's also uh, blonde toasting. So really, it's you don't pick up any vanilla or any of those lactone characters. Um, it's all it's all it's very subtle, subtle oaking. It almost just uplift the spice of it. It's really a beautiful wine. And this is just a if you can all see that. A video of video of the block of Shannon. You can see it's very neat. Just play it again, very neat. And the soil, uh, it's very clean. Sure. Uh, and as you can, if you look there in that bush vine in front of you, you know, it's like almost like the middle. I always tell the guys, please, we have to make like a window in the middle of this bush vine. And for the sunlight to go in, you don't want it to be too dense on the inside. Otherwise, you will also get a lot of unevenness uh, in, in, in the vine. You want uh, the outside will be riper uh, bunches with yellow, yellow, uh, uh, yellow fruit and the inside will still be very green. So you need to make a window uh, in the middle of the, of the bush vine. 
Um, and these vines are like also 20 years old and very, very nicely formed already. I'll show you. You can see it uh, just now with the pinotage. You'll see a better example, but that's much older. That's just the, uh, a small little snippet of the decomposed or the granite uh, type of soil. You can see much lighter, lighter in color um, than the, the the Hutton soil, which absorbs more 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 heat. This one reflects more heat, so you get nice and uniform. Even though um, you know you might get some bunches that's a bit uh, hidden behind leaves from the outside, but if this it reflects a bit of sunlight from the bottom as well, so you get nice and even ripening um, on these soils. The Pinotas Reserve is actually grown about two kilometers from the Shannon Reserve. The grapes, uh, these grapes, are all taken to 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 Sarnsberg. Um, and uh, yeah, so actually the farmer that farms the grapes are, he's my second cousin, but I don't tell it to everybody because he's quite a difficult guy and um, he doesn't always listen to what you say and you have to, he's very stubborn. So, um, which I'm obviously not, I'm nothing like that, but anyway, he's um, far, he's, he's far away family. Um, so yeah, obviously being, being a bit of bush vine, it gives you a lot of thicker skin. Uh, the, the color that you get on the spinatars is immense. Uh, you know, it's it looks uh, it's really really intense black color, um, but it's beautiful, subtle. I I always say I love to make uh, wines with power and elegance, and this is a good example of that because um, they are very they're very much two opposites. I mean, it's difficult to get a wine with power and elegance, um, but that's just what I aim on making and. Um, you can do, can do that right, and you know you're on the right track. Um, so the lovely dark fruit with some feinbos spice, but that's typical Swartland, that feinbos that you find in, in the wines um, and in, in the Pinotas and Shiraz, you always get that bit of feinbos. Um, but this is, uh, the 2020 got five stars on platter, which is, uh, well, that was quite a big achievement for, for Survivor last year. Um, and the 2021, which I've just uh, bottled uh, about a month ago, that's going to hopefully follow its foot in its footste footsteps. Uh, we've actually had to, the 2020 vintage, we only bottled uh, 2,300 bottles. But with this, we're going to have to, for the next vintages, we're already doubling the the amount because we can't keep ahead. We released the 2020 in June and it sold out within four months. So um, obviously, yeah, I'll let you know some pricing afterwards. Um, but uh, it's it's our you know most expensive wine was before we released the the Trudeau wines, the Salamasa wines. But it's sold out with no no hassles at all. People don't mind spending money for good wine. This is the the bush vine. You can see, uh, yeah, this is about twenty five year old bush vine. Um, okay, the the others aren't as exposed as this one, but uh, this is probably a extreme exposed uh, vine. But um, yeah, you can see the others are a bit more canopy. But the, we do break out. Um, we don't break out a lot. Obviously, the older the vine get, the more it gets into shape and it, the more it, uh, other than our human beings, but um, the less we have to to do to it, you know, it understands what we want to do with it. So it's it just becomes more clever, the older it gets. And so we don't have to do a lot of work, but just break out a little, little bit of um, uh, crop thinning, maybe if it's like in a really dry year, if we didn't get the rain in December, we would have probably have to cut off about 30% of the bunches um, uh, enable for the for the vine to ripen its grapes and the price would have gone up by 30 percent as well uh, you can see how light the soil is there yeah you can see the soil uh yeah, you can see closer the decomposed granite and granite particles there um so yeah you can really great for making elegant pinotages and really the spice that you get from the pinotage uh, is tremendous. Um, I actually, 
had a producer from the Spartan with the same swirl that in, in the beginning stages uh, at Rakes, I didn't have enough. Um, so I had to buy in a little bit and I used a little bit from from the producer with this and, and the spice that you got of that was just tremendous. Now I've got the same kind of spice, which is amazing. Okay, cool. So now we're on the Seller Master series. Um, I'm going to ask... Uh, so the, yeah, just before Andrea, before you show the video, uh, when I started with Survivor last year, Gerard said, um, please, uh, I want you to make something. Uh, let's take an area like Trudeau uh, and, and, you know, let's, let's help them get their mojo back. Let's do something different. Let's, let's invest in, in, in an area that we know that, we, that can make really great wines. Um, and, uh, we let's let's be experimental let's try and do new things and uh, so we've made this uh cabernet franc merlot and the chardonnay which they already make uh, uh, we actually um buy the grapes from trado uh, mayor hubert hubert trado uh, and we make it at omenkerk um but the first vintage that i've done with the cabernet franc merlot it was a 2019. Obviously, if you put, can, if you had good maths, you'd know I was still at Rake. So he, Mayer said, please go into my cellar. Go. I didn't borrow any 18, 19, 20, 21. Uh, taste all the barrels and see and, and make for yourself a really great wine. So I went through like 200 barrels myself and Ben, and uh, we discovered these um, 1,500 liters of Cabernet Franc. And a little bit of Merlot. The Merlot was from 2020 vintage, and a Cabernet Franc from from uh, 2019. So that was the first um, try. And um, then recently, only this week, we launched the 2022 Chardonnay. Um, but I'll get to that just now. So if um, Andrea can quickly show this video uh, that we that we made last year, it's always nice to show you a small video and excuse the sound, especially to our South African viewers. The sound might not be great, but hopefully it comes through great in, in Europe. Uh, it's also got diverse soils of uh, shale and uh, some clay and loam soil that's very good for Cabernet Franc and Merlot. And uh, the shale soil is really excellent for Chardonnay, showing a lot of purity of fruit. We'd love to show the diversity of South Africa. And uh, that's why we select the best terroirs in uh, the best areas. So we've got the terroir range we make from the Swartland area and also from Elgin and Stellenbosch. Then we have the reserve range, which is a selection of uh, ten best barrels on the Shannon and Pinotage. And then we have the Salamos series from the Tradeau and the Himalayan Arder Ridge. So it's a very moderate climate uh, in, in Tradeau. It's very different than the rest of the Klein Karoo. Uh, so it's very unique. Um, and we wanted to show you guys the unique pockets of South Africa. And this is one of the most unique um, uh, valleys in, in South Africa at the moment. Uh, really, I think it's very much undiscovered yet. We're very happy to showcase some of the best of Trudeau. A survivor can be compared to the Nguni cattle breed, which is um, showing, shows a lot of inner strength, power and resilience and its adaptability. And that's why we make wine in all these different areas, which uh, we are very adaptable. And uh, yeah, the Nguni is part of our heritage and we want to make wine for people. Okay, cool. Um, I'm not sure how much more your presentation is, uh, Pierre. We are all sort of just about hitting. Yes, so uh, <laughs> sorry, I'll just quickly run through that. Um, so, Trudeau with Chardonnay, yeah. Um, uh, like I said, it's in the heart of the Karoo. Um, cold nights, warm days, great for concentration of fruit. What we want to bring out in this range is purity of fruit and uh, terroir. So, yeah, sorry, I'll just run through here. And as I said earlier on Bockefell Shale, 
Vinayan Sohan uh, 22 years old, and more the, the, where the other one was more Montrachet, this is more Chablis style in comparison. Um, but yeah, these wines aged tremendously well. This was on a date last year of picking, um, on day of picking, uh, that this big block of Chardonnay here. Um, we only harvested about half of it and the rest Mayer took. Um, right, so I think um, that was basically it. Sorry, I'm not going to... That's... Uh, yeah, the, the Trudeau vineyards are... We, you know, it's very really dry there, so we hardly ever have to spray, so which is great. It's not organically farmed, but um, they basically spray maybe once, once in a season, and that's it if necessary. Um, and it used to be a lot more vineyards growing there. Now these days, it's got loads of fruit as well. So um, they, the vineyards are getting less and less in this area. But we next year we're planting some alberinu. Um, I love Albrino and I'm, this, these soils are going to be exceptional for that. Anyway, guys, sorry, uh, I had to just go quick. I, I didn't realize the time went so fast. No, that's great. Thank you very much, Pierre. I know that some people may have to leave, but obviously there is opportunity for anybody that's still with us if they could ask, you know, if they've got any questions for Pierre. Yeah, yeah there, are a, uh, there are a few questions. First of all, I just want to say, Pierre, those winemaker selection wines i've tasted both the pendulum and the chardonnay more than once and they are yeah. both delicious and quite a departure for, for survivor under your um leadership so i'm looking forward to all the new wines of this year so please don't disappoint me um <laughs> so the, no never the, never <laughs> never yeah be 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 we are be aware so um there's a couple of there are a couple of questions here. Vivian says while she was here in, in South Africa, she tasted quite a few Grenache wines and they were absolutely delicious. And is that something that you um, can see in the future to work with? Uh, yeah, at the moment we're just focusing because we're such a young uh, brand still. We're just focusing on what we do and make it really well. And then uh, Grenache is definitely an option for the future. Yes, um, we're actually working on something at the moment um that we're going to incorporate not so much in the cellar master series but we'll we, we we're looking at um doing experimenting with cultivars like grenache because definitely in a swart land it does so well and you get lovely lovely examples of it so yes um that's also something that we'll look into in the future yeah and um christos wants to know the the blanc de, uh, the, the the cup classique is it is it a blanc de blanc or because you didn't mention yeah. anything other than chardonnay yes it's a blanc de blanc good and then keith always the academic um isn't the virus a little bit helpful in restricting the yield and the and reducing the vigor of of the vines when you were speaking earlier about um virus being the biggest threat in south african vineyards yeah, no, um, not at all. Um, you know what? If if you get virus, you don't get ripeness. You 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 especially with late varieties like Cabernet, you get um, you struggle with especially in cooler areas uh, like Stellenbosch and so forth. You you don't get the sugar ripeness and you don't get phenolic ripeness and you get uh, wines with not great color and high pH is because it's very long hang time and you wait and you wait for the sugars and 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 uh, no, it's actually. Uh, in contrary, um, at, at Rakes, we also had some pinotars with virus and it's early variety and it didn't want to pick up sugar and you lost that um, lovely flavor spectrum. It was so, also, it, we used it for rosé to be, um, just to sum it up. Um, no, um, it's, uh, you get a lot of unevenness. Yesterday when I did, I walked around in a swart line in that one block of pinotars, the, the clear, clean block, the clean vines compared to the virus infected ones, you can already see the ones with the red, reddish uh, color coming through. Uh, there was a big difference in flavor uh, profile and also in sugar ripeness. So the ones that were clean with no virus were like two belling higher and the ones with, and there was loads of flavor where the ones with, with, with virus uh, were like acidic and watery and were like two bellings lower. So you would have, if you pick it together, you'll get, uh, 
uh, quite a quite a difference in your tank. It will come through in your tank one uh, at at um, crushing the stemming. It will be twenty five belling, and then tomorrow it will be twenty three, and then it will jump again. So it's very it's it's not good for for the quality of the wine. Uh, and you can go already this year. Tell people with knowledge, just pick the green vines, the vines with no virus. Um, but if you have to pick twenty tons, I mean, try and manage that one. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. Well, but- um, and of course, everybody's saying thank you very much. And of course, as expected, a wonderful, uh, thorough presentation, Pierre. But I, I just wanted to add that I've tasted the Survivor wines over many years now, and it's definitely, um, it, it's definitely showing more the, the fact that you are choosing the, the the areas more specifically. Because I know of, for example, Chardonnay that used to come from another area, and we tasted it one year, and it was absolutely substandard and in fact blended away in the end um, and before you change to to Elgin so well done for picking out those specific spots and actually looking after them as carefully as you do because I know that you're always on the road whenever I'm looking for you I find you in a vineyard or in on the road so um, well done any other questions for Thanks, Pierre Anna. I had a quick one as to when you were planning to export to other countries, because I know you said you were growing um, the volume or increasing the volume. It's just whether it's the UK and US. And- yes, we just, I uh, don't know if you have uh, an article in the Harper's about two days ago. Um, there was uh, an, a buyer, some buyer, a buyer, there's a blog on the buyer or whatever. But uh, yeah, we've just been taken on by Beyond Wines um, in the UK. And uh, they do have they would also make they're gonna they're gonna start purchasing our wines for their for their for their top top wine range um but yeah so that's going to be something for the future um for this year they've taken our whole range that's great definitely and then uh, obviously the us we're still looking for agents but uh, our biggest market is as i said holland and and belgium yeah. and pierre uh, neil just wants to know price points more or less from the from the terroir range up to the top, if you can get, if, do you know? Euro, because Neil y- is Euro in price. Is Euro okay? Neil, yeah. Euro pricing. So the Euro price, FOB price. Okay, FOB pricing. I've got um, retail. Okay, so FOBs will be around about uh, for the for the white wines. Uh, uh, six euro um, for the terroir range that the blue labels or the the first ones and then the the Shiraz and Pinotage and uh, Cabernet will be seven euro um, and uh, um, the the reserve range will be eleven uh, and twelve euro FOB so what retail will be obviously FOB is free on board it's like uh, what we sell to an importer no, is no, what we what, sell what to our in the shops Pierre. If, if Neil wants to go and buy a bottle when he next yeah goes okay to- so um yeah man I love you okay so <laughs> so yeah. so in the shops it'll be about four uh, thirteen euro fifty for the Chardonnay uh, twelve euro for the Sauvignon Blanc and Chenin um, the Pinotage will be about fifteen euro and and the Cabernet and the Syrah fifteen euros and then the um, the reserve range will be about 20 euros in, in retail. And the Pendulum and the Shawna Salamasa series will be uh, closer to 30. Right. Well, I'm very pleased yeah. that it's going to be available in the UK because um, I'm there very often and I like to show off South African wines. So um, well done. Any other questions or comments? Well, Back to you, Andrea. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much, Pierre. Super presentation. Um, great to see the, the huge range that you have available. Um, thank everybody else for attending today. And please join us next Friday when we'll be talking about Prosecco. And not all Prosecco is the same with Sarah Abbott, Master of Wine. So look-